Welcome back, Calc BC. Good to see you guys again. Uh, thanks for tuning in for our video today. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, one of the main applications of integration, uh, which is solving differential equations. I will actually spend uh, the next three sessions talking about this, um, largely because uh, uh, differential equations is a uh, pretty pretty complicated application of integration. Uh, and there's a lot of nuances to, to some of it that I think I uh, want to make sure that we get to. Uh, this year, we're also going to be uh, diving a little deeper into them than we did maybe last year in your Calc AB class. So um, we'll start with a very simple one. Um, we'll start with sort of the basic uh, growth and decay equation, show kind of where that comes from. And then uh, we'll look at some applications of that. And uh, next week, uh, when we come back together, um, we'll be looking at two different kinds of differential equations. Um, one which I think you'll recognize is very similar to what we're doing today. And then the one for, latter, for the latter part of the week, I think uh, we'll have a, a much more in-depth video on that one. So anyway, without further ado, let's get to it. Uh, the, uh, the differential equation that we're gonna be talking about today or the, the, the topic, I guess, uh, our growth, oops, growth and decay. Um, differential equations. I should add that uh, differential equations is actually a, a topic uh, of study. Um, you can actually take a whole, an entire course, a quarter long course in differential equations uh, when you're in college. Uh, it's uh, one of the required courses, especially if you're uh, thinking along the lines of an engineering major. So um, definitely is something that you're going to be uh, seeing a whole lot more of if you're headed down the engineering path. Uh, if you're not headed down the engineering path, then maybe there's uh, not as much differential equation in your future, although most, most math majors will, will end up having to take it at some point, um, unless you find that you have a real uh, in-depth love of statistics and that sort of thing, uh, in which case maybe you would, um, you would take a statistics course. All right. Um, so I'm going to start off with just a quick reminder that when we're talking about a differential equation, we're talking about an equation that has derivatives in it. So uh, for example, um, this is not the, uh, the primary one that we're talking about today, but just a reminder, you know, if my equation were y prime equals 2x over y, um, the idea would be to solve this um, for an equation uh, that would... Uh, be a solution to this differential equation. So uh, you probably remember that you're going to move the y over like so. Um, oftentimes, right, uh, we would integrate, um, you know, the, the y prime, I, I kind of prefer to write it as dy over dx like so, because then I can really visually see, oh, that differential dx needs to go over to the right hand side. Um, like so, and now we're ready to integrate. We have y's and dy's on the left side. We have x's and dx's on the right hand side. So we're ready to go. Uh, and of course, uh, one half y squared uh, equals x squared plus c. Now, if you're saying, well, hey, wouldn't there be a c on the left hand side as well? Yes, there would. Um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's okay to just put one C on one side that just sort of encompasses all the C's. If you really want to, you can have, okay, so there's a C over here, there's a C over here. Now combine them together, um, subtract C1 from both sides. Well, it's just a constant. We're just playing around with the constant at that point. Um, so you want to have Y squared plus X squared equals, you know, C, let's call it C3. Um, Oops, I wrote those signs wrong. Boy, still got the winter break thing going on, don't I? <laughs> if you were in class with me on uh, on uh, Monday, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it was a mess. All right, um, and you know this is the idea that we would then have this equation. I, I actually think um, when you get you to this point, you really want to come up with the general solution that has the constant isolated. So um, I would think you would oops, really rather have something like this. Um, come here, there we go. 
uh, and this this is a different C altogether now because you can see I've multiplied everything by two. So this C is actually two times what I have down there, C3 and everything collected on the one side. Uh, so anyway, there we go. Um, that's a, a, an example that's just solving differential equation. Just a quick reminder that that's what we're talking about. Okay, um, the specific one that we're talking about today uh, is the differential equation that we get when we solve, um, uh, you know, when Euler was doing a lot of his work, uh, he was looking at things in nature, right, that the rate of change of that quantity dy dx was actually directly proportional to the size of whatever the population was. So dy dx equals some constant of proportionality times, times y. And uh, if I follow sort of the same logic that I just followed before, uh, you can see I'll get dy over y equals k times dx. And when I integrate this one, Okay, uh, on the left hand side, you can see we get a natural log. We get the natural log of y here. And over here on the right side, well, that's a constant k dx. So we get k times x plus our constant of integration over here. Now, uh, again, I know there's one on each side. Let's just collect them all onto the, the one side anyway. Now, in this case, I haven't actually solved the differential equation yet because I've, I've solved for the natural log of y. And uh, way back when, probably pre-calculus uh, mathematics uh, algebra two year, we learned how to solve logarithmic equations. Um, we would rewrite it exponentially or um, the verb that we sometimes said was we're gonna exponentiate the equation by making both sides an exponent of the base of the logarithm. Uh, obviously the base of the natural log is E. So E and natural log cancel each other out. So now we have e to this power, it's supposed to be a k, plus c1. And there is a property from exponents that uh, you probably remember. It says, hey, look, if you have a sum in the exponents, Right, that's just because you were multiplying two things with the same base together. So that's what I'm gonna do on this left-hand side. And I get e to the k x times e to the c1. Well, remember that c1 was just a constant. e is also a constant. So this term e to the c1 is a constant. And so when I put that all together, um, we get the rather famous y equals c e to the kx. And that's the growth and decay equation that we want to look at today. Uh, I know you can write these with other bases. You, can don't, you don't have to use the base e. Uh, we're going to use the base E because um, this, this equation then can be used in infinitely many different applications. Uh, you know, if you use the, if you use like if it's doubling, use a base two, if it's tri tripling, use a base three, blah, 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 go on and on. Yeah, it's like, eh, then I got to write it, read different, you know, a new one each time. This is much easier. Everything just comes down to, can you solve for C? Can you solve for K? Now, last year we did this equation. And so you probably already remember that C uh, is the initial quantity of whatever it is. And the K is then the, the constant, um, could be the growth rate if it's growing or the decay rate if it's decaying. Um, remembering that is, that's uh, kind of, it, it's growth. If K is positive, it's decay. If K is negative and um, you can actually see that when you solve any of the uh, equations that we might have. So let's take a look at a couple of quick models here. Um, the first one I have just says the rate of change of y is proportional to y. So the rate of change of y is proportional to y. Okay, so we already know 
Okay, that's got to be the solution. Um, and it says here when, um, oh, it says T, but I'll say X. When X is zero, Y is equal to two. Okay, when X is two, Y is equal to four. So when X is three, what's Y equal? So this is usually how these problems go. They give you some sort of way to solve for various pieces of the equation, the C and the K, and then you are asked to do some third uh, set with it. So let's start off with, if X is zero, Y is two. You see, if X is zero, we get E to the zero power, which of course we know is one. So we know that C is equal to two. Now, let's go to the next point. Uh, well, if X is two, Y is four. So we go four equals two E to the two K. See, I plug in the two for X, the four for Y. And now this is something I can solve for K. I get divide by two. Okay, now the exponent is what I want to solve for. So obviously we need to use the natural log, right? So we get the natural log of two equals two K. So we'll divide by two like so. And K is the natural log of two over two. Now that's some decimal number. I'm not gonna worry about the decimal number right now. I'm just gonna come back and say, well, uh, to answer my final question then, you know, what is Y when X is three? Well, I know it's gonna be two times E. Okay, so now here's K, natural log of two over two times three. And that again is some decimal number, which is at this point where you would go to a calculator and you'd say two times e to the natural log of two over two times three. And my final answer here is four times the square root of two. All right. Approximately 5.657, if you wanted a decimal approximation. And then a lot of times we do in these, in these application problems because you know, four root two, while a precise number, isn't necessarily very useful. Okay. Um, that's a nice one. Uh, let's take a look at another example. And we'll look at one that is one of the most common examples, which is a half-life problem. Um, the half-life uh, that we're talking about here, not the game, um, we're talking about the half-life of a radioactive element. So uh, for those of you in physics, you've probably dealt with a few different uh, radioactive elements. Um, there's a nice table on, on 363, which deals with some of the radioactive elements there. Um, you know, uh, looking at their half-lives, you know, you go to uranium, um, you, you, uranium-238 has a very, very long half-life. It's four and a half billion years. Um, so it takes a long time for uranium to half-life decay. Um, you know, plutonium is much faster at 24,360 years. Um, one of the ones that you've probably heard a lot about is carbon-14. Um, carbon-14 dating is a, is a way to figure out how old certain things are. Um, it's really only good back, you know, a couple, you know, 10,000, 20,000 years, much older than that. And the carbon-14 measurements are pretty tough to make because uh, so much of it is decayed out of the, of the uh, material by then. Um, Radium, we use radium for a lot of things. Uh, that half-life is uh, 1,620 years. Um, Einsteinium is very, very short, 270 days. 
Uh, but Nobelium is the short one here. <laughs> that one only has a half-life of 23 seconds. So uh, you can see there's a whole lot of different half-lives in here that are given. So how does this really work? Well, um, the amount of uh, decay, the rate of decay is directly proportional to the amount of the material that's there. Again, this is what Euler was interested in, a naturally occurring phenomenon like radioactive decay. Um, how do we how do we model that mathematically? And so let's take a look at a half life. Um, let's take uh, gosh, I don't know. Um, I guess I guess the the one that's in the news right now is is um, you know the uh, the Iranian uh, government has started their their enriching uranium again, um, trying to get to uh, uranium that they can then turn into plutonium. Um, uh, because uh, PU-239 is uh, weapons-grade plutonium. And the idea would be, um, you know, they want to develop a, a nuclear weapon. Uh, we should probably not uh, have more nuclear weapons. It's just my own personal bias there, I will say. Um, PU-239 is uh, incredibly powerful. Um, uh, and and the, the reason that it's so powerful uh, is it doesn't take very much of this stuff to, to release a whole lot of energy. And so let's take a look at how long it would take then for an area to, to recover from that. So let's say that we have um, the half-life for PU-239 uh, is 24,360 years. So the first thing we're gonna do uh, with this information is figure out what is the constant Okay, again, radioactive decay works like any of these other ones. Okay, um, you know, you always can uh, use this equation when it's the rate of change is directly proportional to the amount of material. So I'm gonna start off with just saying half-life. Well, okay, so if I start with an initial quantity of C, we saw that in the previous one, then how much is left after 24,360 years? Half of C. 24,360 years. And so notice the C doesn't actually matter. It divides right out of the equation. And so we end up with one half equals E to the 24,360K. Now, um, at this point, we will use a natural log. And you'll see the natural log of a half over 24,360 years is equal to K. Um, just to put that in a, as a decimal, divided by 24,360, um, K turns out to be negative 0. 0.000028. Uh, okay. So, um, now, now that we have our constant, um, what we can do is answer some other question for this thing then. Like um, the example that I have here is suppose that in a, in a radioactive detonation, um, we release uh, 10 grams of this plutonium. Okay. Um, and basically that renders the area uninhabitable. Um, that's a lot of plutonium. That's a lot of radiation. You would get sick and, and die quite quickly uh, if you were exposed to this much plutonium. So we have to wait. Um, and we need to know how long will we have to wait uh, to be really safe till one gram remains. Okay, well, that's what I was saying earlier, like these questions usually come down to, okay, so you've solved for your constant, you know that C is the initial quantity, answer this question. Well, I want to wait till I have one gram, starting from 10, I need to solve this equation for T. 
And right away, you can see you, do, you have to isolate the exponentials. So we'll get 0.1 equals e to the negative 0.000028t. Again, natural log both sides. I'm going to do that right now. Natural log of 0.1. This is negative 2.30. 2.59 and divide by our constant. Divide by negative 0 0.00028. And it turns out so we have to wait a mere 82,235.2 years until that area would then be inhabitable again, uh, safely for humans. So as you can see, uh, plutonium, you don't really wanna mess around with it <laughs> because um, you know part of the problem with the nuclear detonation um, nuclear fission detonation like this one, uh, you end up spraying this stuff around a pretty big area and it makes a pretty large area uninhabitable for many thousands of years, which is not ideal. Um, coincidentally, uh, that is for a fission bomb. Uh, there is such a thing as a fusion bomb, um, which uh, really ups the uh, total destruction and devastation that the bomb can yield. Uh, also, a very dangerous thing. Um, it basically uses the fission bomb as a way to focus the energy to create um, a, a fusion reaction uh, where they get a couple of hydrogen isotopes to fuse into helium, um, which releases even more energy uh, in the explosion, um, spreading our radiation and our devastation out across a much wider area. Um, greatly increasing what they call the yield of the bomb, which is a, kind of a weird thing because we talk about yield of crops. Well, they also talk about that yield of bombs. So anyway, uh, yeah, 82,000 years uh, is an awfully long time. So um, there's a nice example of the uh, uh, use of our growth and or decay function. Um, Let's see here, that's a decay one. We'll finish up with a, a much happier example of growth and then um, we'll, uh, we'll uh, shut off the, the recording because uh, that's all we need today. So uh, same idea, the size of a population of fruit flies grows, so the rate of change, proportionately with the size of the population. There we go. Uh, so already we know the equation governing this is y equals c e to the kt. Um, now this time, uh, it's a, a population of fruit flies. Um, we had uh, 100 fruit flies on day two. And 300 on the fourth day. Oh, wow. This is why they're so hard to get out of your house. Once you get them in there uh, every fall, so frustrating. Uh, we're going to do the same kind of thing here. This time it's a little tougher because they didn't give us C right away. Okay. I can uh, use this equation to give me two equations though, right? I know when t is two, y is 100. I know when t is four, uh, y is 300. So now you can see um, that uh, I'm able to create a uh, um, equation here for, uh, for c. From, it doesn't matter which one, you could just solve this first one, let's say. So let's divide by e to the 2k. 
Now, obviously, we could bring that up from the numerator. Okay, and now we see we have a C, we, we can solve this by substitution. Plug that into my other equation. Um, with this uh, same base here, I can just add my exponents. Like so. Natural log both sides. And then you can see that we can divide by two and then my natural log of three divided by two is uh, 0.5493. Oh, 06. And I have my calculator set to only display six. Um, but if I were to try and answer a question, another a follow up question to this thing, um, I would want to be sure to use as many decimals as possible. Okay. Um, like I need to figure out what C is right now. Okay. Well, I'm not going to just use this decimal number here. I'm going to use everything the calculator can say, have in it. Because I'm going to say, well, I need to know what C is. It's E to the negative two times natural log of three over two. Oh, look, I can solve this one precisely, right? The twos will cancel. It's e to the negative natural log of three. Make it positive by putting it in the denominator e is a negative natural log of three. That's just three. They cancel each other out. So 100 thirds is C. So my final answer here would be my, mo my model for this. And so then if they said, um, you know, okay, now predict how many fruit flies we'll have on day eight. Now I can just plug that in there and say, well, okay, so I have a hundred thirds times E to the uh, natural log two times eight. And on day eight, we would have 2,700 fruit flies. Um, so again, using all the decimals that I can uh, in my calculator, not rounding in the middle of the problem, especially with these exponential problems. So, all right, well, that's it for today, guys. So that's it, exponential growth and decay. All comes down to solving that one little differential equation and using the formula y equals ce to the kt or kx, depending on what your variables are. All right, thanks guys, we'll see you in class.